Hello, this is Gary Pinnell, and I would like to start our Bible study for today. If you're reading through the Bible with us, you would be in Luke chapter 10, of course, and also Ecclesiastes chapter 10, Zechariah chapter 10. So keep that in mind. We have been working our way through Luke. Luke is about Jesus as the perfect man. And he certainly is perfect in every way. Uh, the, ch the young people and children today, they're like a superhero. Well, I'll tell you, he is more than a superhero. He is God's perfect son. Now, Adam, the first Adam, blew it. He sinned. He disobeyed God, but the second Adam, Jesus, the Son of God, is perfect in every way. He did not blow it in any way. And so now as we move along, we see what God is like. And um, Jesus is revealing the Father perfectly to us. And remember later on, and well, in John chapter... Um, 16, we see how Philip's asking us, show us the Father, Jesus, and we'll be satisfied. Jesus says, uh, Philip, you know, have I been so long with you and you haven't understood yet? When you see me, you see the Father. That's what the Father is like perfectly. And so we see that what he emphasizes the healing, the cleansing, changing hearts and lives. This is what God is all about. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. So they prepared the way before him and so it's not just the 12 that were sent out. Jesus sent others, 70 on this, uh, actually 72 on this occasion. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay, so... I want us to start praying that as well. Um, there's a key. I mean, we always say there's not enough witnesses to get the gospel out. Well, what if we start praying for more witnesses, more people to get out sharing the gospel and realizing that the time is short? And so when we pray, Let's remember to pray about these things. So important. And that's what Jesus was telling them. You want to see some more workers? Then pray for those. And of course, Jesus would spend lots of time in prayer, as we should as well. And I know that's a weak area in my life, is the area of prayer. And so, therefore... Pray earnestly to the Lord. So how do we pray? We pray earnestly with all our hearts, sincerely, to see that many souls will be saved. There will be revival in our countries. All right? Oh, boy. Therefore, I can't get over it. He says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs. Lambs have no protection other than their shepherd. In the midst of wolves, carry no money bag. So you don't have to worry about the money. The Lord is going to take care of that. You're serving the Lord. No knapsack. Okay, so you don't need to have a bunch of things along with you. No sandals extra sandals you don't need any of those and greet no one on the road 
So just be really serious about it. Like in the book of Mark, uh, Jesus, it says he went quickly from one place to another. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. Shalom, and then however you say house, so uh, uh, bite, I think, shalom, bite, uh, uh, to the house. Uh, but anyway, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages. So do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Hmm. Okay. So we, as we go out as missionaries, as we go out as to share the gospel, the Lord will be with us and help us. I know when we were going, getting ready to go to Trinidad and Tobago as missionaries, there uh, we went to different homes and we're staying there with them. And I will tell you, sometimes the homes were poor. They were poor people. Uh, one time I remember we were uh, eating our food and I didn't tell Marlene until later, but there was... Um, two little uh, bugs that I had taken out of the food and put on the side of my dish. Um, and kind of got them out of there went right away so nobody saw it. Uh, of course, they were had been cooked in with the meal. And I had to just trust the Lord that, you know, I had to keep going and uh, realize that God would give me strength just to eat what was set before me. And uh, we can't be picky. We need to realize what God, as you go out to serve the Lord, uh, eat what's set before you. Might be some things that are not normal things that you would eat. But uh, if you're going out to serve the Lord, you need to be willing to eat whatever is put before you. And then it says, uh, heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Well, when, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more tolerable more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. All right, remember how Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of their homosexuality. But there's places in the world, they're not accepting the gospel. The country isn't, the people aren't. Let me tell you, as some of the people aren't, the governments aren't sometimes. I used to wonder, well, these places like the churches that are mentioned in Revelation, they are places that there's still people there today in most of those places. Well, why aren't they still Christians? Why isn't there still a church there? And then the Lord spoke to me and showed me that through the years, nations have rejected him. They've kicked the Christians out. Look at the Muslim nations have tried to turn the Christians into slaves, either kick them out, uh, kill them, behead them some places, uh, make their lives miserable. Uh, look at Iran. They don't allow you to have a Bible. If they find out about it, you're in big trouble and put you in jail for things like that. You don't have a church. There's no churches that are above ground. They don't have freedom or religion. And so the churches and people that are there uh, are they're risking their lives. Well, now you wonder why aren't there uh, so many Christians there? That's the reason. But uh, uh, as far as out in the open, 
Now, I will tell you this, in these countries like, uh, well, North Korea would be so dangerous, you would be killed almost immediately. Uh, Somalia, you would be killed almost immediately. And some of these countries, uh, when um, you are a Christian, so it's not e easy to be a Christian. But other nations that are Muslim nations, I'll tell you, some of those are ones that are having huge earthquakes right now <coughs> in these countries. And uh, they've chased God out. They've chased the gospel out. They've chased anything about Christ out. And so uh, this is what he's saying. It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom. You see, Sodom was filled with homosexuality. And uh, it was destroyed. And they'll try to say, oh, no, it's because they're, uh, you know, not kind to the poor and the visitors and so on. Well, that too. But their biggest problem was the homosexuality. God will judge. And uh, Billy Graham used to say, if uh, God doesn't judge America, then he'll have to apologize to Sodom. You see, that is, uh, we have to take a stand, people. Now, we love homosexuals, just like Jesus loved everyone, forgave even those people that were killing him on the cross. And Stephen, God forgive them. And uh, But on the other hand, we need to uh, be willing to get the gospel out, even if it's hard. The Lord is going to protect us. But those nations and people, villages that reject, the cities that reject the gospel, well, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom than it will be for them because it's going to be really bad uh, for those nations and those individuals that rejected the Lord. Well, to you, Chorazin. Look, at there's an exclamation mark, so I'm going to read it again a little bit better. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you and you, Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? you shall be brought down to Hades. All right, places that rejected the gospel. Jesus did many miracles in Capernaum and these other places he's talking about, but they didn't repent. They didn't turn to the Lord. The scripture says that a nation has to repent too. And uh, our nation, if we don't repent, if there's not revival and people asking God's forgiveness for the 62 million plus babies that have been aborted, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. They don't count lots of them uh, that are done with the morning after pills and so on. Uh, so if we don't repent of this, can you imagine what it's going to be like in the United States? Look at some of these nations around the world. They did not repent. And then they got rid of the Christians. They killed them. They made them have to flee and exile to other countries. Look what is going to happen to those nations. Look at uh, some of the nations now. India and Brazil and Russia, Iran. China. They are in for big trouble. As far as God is concerned, you, you better watch out because uh, it's coming. And it, uh, you shall be brought down to Hades. Nations that keep God out, turn him away. And our nation has. And uh, kicked him out of the public schools. And uh, so many other other places, the government. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects 
you rejects me. So you do that to Christians, you know what? You're rejecting Jesus. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. You reject Jesus, you're rejecting the Father. You think, oh, there's one God and we're worshiping him, uh, Jewish people. Uh, guess what? If you don't accept Jesus as your Messiah, you're not really worshiping God the Father. Muslims, you think you're worshiping one God? No, you're not, uh, because you reject Jesus. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. All right, so... Um, that is the most important thing, <laughs> is that you're saved. God will do these miracles. God will protect us. Now, that's not saying that their Christians are never killed. Obviously, they are. Uh, persecution. They that love godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But as long as the Lord wants us to be alive, and uh, missionaries that go out, he does mighty miracles for them. Uh, our son was at a point of death, and he was in the hospital. And uh, we had to take him out of one hospital and put him in a Seventh-day Adventist hospital. But it was almost Christmas, Christmas time, and we were feeling so badly uh, as we'd gone there. And he had gotten mosquito bites, and we didn't realize that uh, that could be so uh, serious. And so he had been scratching and became infected, and he was dying. And uh, so we prayed, and the Lord healed his body. He has no um, reminder of that in his body to this day. His name is Michael. But that was a miracle that the Lord did, and because we were serving the Lord there. And there's many, many miracles the Lord does for those who go out as missionaries. Uh, act, uh, excuse me, Mark. At the end of Mark, chapter 16, it says the same thing to us. And so we need to believe his word. Go out, trust him. And some people, uh, they say, oh, I'm frightened if there's demons and so on. No, uh, fear is not from God, it's from Satan. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power of sound mind. We don't go looking for demons and people. But you know what? If there are, and when we're praying, they will manifest themselves, and then we'll cast them out in the name of the Lord. Now, what we'll do is to pray for healing for people. Now, the thing is, some people, I don't want to pray for healing, but what if the person's not healed right away? Where does it say that he will do the healing instantly? We're not trusting God, people, and the churches. The most beautiful thing I have seen is uh, one of the churches that we visit during the worship time, the people know that they can go up and uh, the, the cameras are not watching them, but they're on the, the worship leaders and so on. But down below there, there are many people that are coming up for prayer, prayer for healing. And uh, sometimes there's some, a few and sometimes there's more. But the pastor and the deacons or elders and uh, deaconesses are up there praying for these people. They are expecting God to answer their prayers, to heal them, to help them where they need finances and so on. We need to have faith once again, like Jesus told us to have, and to not leave these things aside, but to do what he said to do. So, then as the uh, 70 went out, and they were uh, seeing many demons cast out. But Jesus said, listen, the most important thing is that your name is written in heaven. That's the greatest miracle of all. And that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Oh, praise God. He's not revealing it to the religious leaders, the fake religious leaders, the false religious leaders. He's not really uh, uh, showing these things to uh, the churches that have backslidden, the churches that are not serving the Lord, uh, the people not, no, he's showing it to the people that are serving him. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus is just rejoicing. And uh, the Father gave him this ministry to go out and reach the lost. I'm just so glad through the years, the ministries that God has given me. And I haven't been a pastor very often. Sometimes I have been a pastor, but I've had funerals and weddings and that sort of thing. But I guess the greatest for me is seeing souls saved. I know for my dad that was, he had a personal witnessing <coughs> ministry he would led many to the lord that way he had uh, trout farms uh or lakes little ponds that he would fill with trout and then he would have the mission children the kids that had never fished before come out and then uh, catch their first fish and i have hundreds of pictures of that and uh, he would tell me about them that had received the lord uh, even though he had been a pastor in the past, the, uh, toward the end of his life, that was his ministry, was, and then he'd have people from the church come and share the gospel with the kids, and the kids would get saved, they would have a little barbecue and so on, and he was just rejoicing when he would see kids saved, how many he was telling me. Well, you know what? That is the greatest thing of all is to see souls saved and lives changed. And don't be afraid to pray for those that need healing. You know many people, they come up to you and they'll talk about their sickness and so, and so on. Say, kindly, can I, it would be all right if I prayed for you. And most people are gonna say, sure, right there on the spot. I've prayed with people in stores and so on. That doesn't matter. Who cares who's looking, you know? Let's just do what God wants us to do and uh, serve him the way that he wants us to. And you know what? The greatest thing on earth, the greatest pleasure to see souls saved on this earth. Get out there and start winning people to the Lord. If you don't know how, uh, seek out somebody that can tell you how to lead people to the Lord. So, uh, Jesus knows this ministry, and he says, I pray that there will be more sent out in the harvest. Okay, uh, we still have quite a few verses to go, so we have to keep going. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. They didn't realize how privileged they were at that point. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Oh, boy, the apostles to seeing what Jesus was doing. But people were living in a time when God is doing mighty miracles. Revivals are breaking out. And we've just got to get out there and stop being the sleepy church. All right, they call this uh, president that we have in the United States. Uh, sleepy Joe Biden. Well, you know what? There's many Christians that are sleeping. They're sleeping. They don't realize how short the time is. We need to get out there and wake them up and uh, challenge them. We need to uh, realize that there are apostate churches. And I can tell you there's one that has embassies in every part of the world. And most of that is an apostate church. 
and uh, they used to know the truth, but they got away from the Lord, and they brought in false doctrines and false heresies. Get out of that church. The Bible says in Revelation, get out of Babylon before it's too late. Get out of her before I judge her. And you see, that's what we need to do. We need to be, uh, God talks about how that the last time days, there is going to be churches that have a form of godliness, but without the power thereof. If your church does not believe in being born again, and they don't uh, have baptisms, uh, they do not teach the word of God, they're teaching something else, but they're not going through the, the Bible. Uh, get out of that church. They don't believe in healings for today. They don't believe the gifts are all the nine gifts. Uh, they say, oh, there's nine gifts that are not for today. Get out of that church and get into a church that's on fire for the Lord. You get on fire for the Lord first, and then you'll want a church like that. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing today. We're not supposed to wait and not supposed to have a form of godliness going through the rituals and the forms. We need to get out there and reach the lost, okay? And it's going to be wonderful. We we'll can see the things that the apostles saw. And so, uh, behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Oh, you're going to test God of the universe. All right, take a shot at it. Saying, teacher, what shall I do um, to inherit eternal life? He said to him, now remember, he doesn't really want to know the truth. He just wants to test Jesus to see if he's got the, if he's really right or not, if he's got the right answer. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus said to him. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. <laughs> so he tur Jesus just turns it back on himself. Uh, you're not saved, fella. You need to be saved yourself. Here's what you need to That's what you need to do. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Okay, there is a question that Jesus wants to answer. <clears throat> you see, the Old Testament law was given to show us our need of salvation. Nobody's perfect. Jesus said, uh, well, you think that you haven't committed adultery? If you looked upon a woman to lust her after, you've committed adultery in your heart with her already. So nobody keeps the law perfectly, and this fellow thought he did. No, nobody does. And nobody's going to get to heaven that way. And it's very clear in Romans. But the law was given to show us that we're sinners and that we have to turn to Christ to save us. He's the one that died on the cross for us. So now, Jesus, because this guy wants to know, well, who is his neighbor? And uh, if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, you need to know who your neighbor is. So he said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to uh, Jericho, and he fell among robbers. A lot of times people were set out there, robbed the travelers and so on, stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. <laughs> Yuck, oh, there's blood and the uh, guy's injured and I got to get over on the other side of the street. I, I can't say that. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. In New York, there's places and people have been run over before and people just leave them there. They don't even stop to help. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, not even a Jew, all right, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Uh, wine could uh, 
stop the infection and so on. And uh, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever more you uh, send, I will repay you when I come back, uh, whatever you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And I think that's very important because there will be people and things that come up that seem to interrupt our day. And don't think of it as interruptions. And I have to speak to myself on this as well. Think of it as the sovereignty of God doing and saying to you, help this person. There's something to do there. And you go out of your way to help them. That is so important. And that those are our neighbors. Those are the ones that have needs. And we need to help them. And anyway, God tells us. And then he says, now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary. This God is going to bless his family. And this is the one, the Lazarus, who's going to be raised from the dead and so on. But just being kind to people, inviting Jesus in, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. You see, which is more important? Jesus has come to your house, and what do you do? And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? <laughs> Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And later Martha realized that too. But um, that is to realize to spend time with Jesus. And what if Jesus came to your house? And there's a, a little pamphlet that I want to read in closing here. If Jesus came to your house. And so I'm going to show it to you and you can read along with me. Uh, but it says, if Jesus came to your house. Hmm. Think about it. If he came to your house. If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you'd do. Oh, I know you'd give your nicest room to such an honored guest, and all the food you'd serve to him would be the very best. And you would keep assuring him you're glad to have him there, that serving him in your own home is joy beyond compare. But when you saw him coming, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched in welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes before you let him in? Or hide your magazines and put the Bible where they had been? Would you turn off the radio and hope that he hadn't heard and wish you hadn't uttered that last loud, hasty word. Would you hide your worldly music and put some hymns, hymn books out? Could you let Jesus walk right in? Or would you rush about? And I wonder, if the Savior spent a day or two with you, would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you always say? Would life for you continue as it 
does from day to day? Would your, your family conversation keep up its usual pace? And would you find it hard each meal to say a table grace? Would you sing the songs you always sing and read the books you read and let him know the things on which your mind and spirit feed? Huh? Would you take Jesus, right? Jesus with you everywhere you'd plan to go? Or would you maybe change your plans for just a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your very closest friends? Or would you hope they'd stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on? Or would you sigh with great relief when he at last was caught? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do, Jesus Christ, and if Jesus Christ in person came to spend some time with you. And that Louise Kimball uh, Blanchard. And that is called If Jesus If Jesus Came to Your House. Okay. So that's uh I th I've always enjoyed that and just felt like uh that really has a special meaning to all of us. And Father, we just come to you now in Jesus' name alone. I pray that we will live the way that you want us to live. We'll say the things that you want us to say. We will be a missionary where you've planted us. And Lord, I just pray for, Lord, the uh, churches that are apostate churches and people are in them, that they'll come out of those and they'll get into churches that are on fire for the Lord. There are churches that are sharing the gospel, realizing the time is short, that the the harvest is is ripe and people are ripe to receive the Lord. And Father, we pray for North Korea again, Lord, that you will bring this wicked dictator down and allow the people to share the gospel once again. Lord, I pray for um, that's in North Korea there and Father, also China, bring this wicked man down that wants worship, puts his pictures on the wall, takes down the crosses from homes, puts his own picture up, tore down all the crosses and all the churches around China. Oh, Lord, bring him low that he has to kneel before you. And Father, I do pray for uh, Pakistan and, and Lord, that you will help them with the persecution that's going on there and in India and Iran and uh, Lord, all these Muslim countries around the world, 80 of them that uh, do not serve you and say that God has no son. And Father, I pray for the Christians in Iran that they will just speak out for you no matter what it costs. And Lord, that you will shake these nations. You will shake the United States, Lord, and show us that we've gotten away from you. We're backslidden and we need to turn back to you. We pray all these things with thanksgiving, Father, in Jesus' precious name, amen. The Lord bless you and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow.